Thank you very much for the invitation. It's always a pleasure uh, to be here. And um, I'm going to try to share my screen now. Let me know if this is okay. Yes, perfect. Okay, thank you very much again for the invitation. And I, um, after this excellent presentation by Dr. Caldwell and the rest of the panelists, uh, I just wanted to um, talk a little bit about what I think for us neurosurgeons is a little bit of, you know, at the end of the endoscopic procedures, but for endoscopic endonasal, uh, especially the expanded surgery is absolutely key to perform and to know as neurosurgeons about the options for reconstruction and be a team with the ENT surgeons, a true team, not only a surgeon who opens, a surgeon who takes the tumor out, the surgeon who closes. And in many, many places of the world, uh, our friends, the neurosurgeons have to also do a lot of these uh, techniques. So it's something that uh, I think we need to pay uh, really close attention to. And as neurosurgeons know uh, how to do and perform and the principles of the endoscopic endonasal reconstruction. So first uh, we see here that, uh, I hope you can see my pointer, but this is a the two views of the same anatomy, the endoscopic anatomy on the left and the open anatomy on the right side of the screen where you can see how two very different approaches, but the same anatomy, uh, you know, and in, in that's the wonderful thing about skull base. We need to now learn the anatomy in several different ways. So we are faced in the endoscopic approaches sometimes with this, kind of defects where we can't really suture as we uh, are used to in the uh, open approaches. So most of the uh, techniques that I'm going to show, the illustrations and the dissections are from this book that we recently published. And especially you know, my fellows, especially the coordinator of the NAB, uh, Luciano Leonel did a lot of these uh, dissections. So he deserves a lot of the credit for um, some of these pictures. So just to start with, you know, the endoscopic endonasal uh, skull base, we have access to all these anatomy, especially in midline. We're going to talk about reconstruction of the main uh, defects that we encounter um, because of the, in the interest of time, but you know, we can access the medial aspect of the orbit, also the cavernous sinus, apart from the midline structures, and then extending lateral to the infratemporal fossa, trigopalatine fossa, etc. But I think it's key to understand that the endoscopic endonasal surgery cannot and should not be performed without a solid plan for reconstruction, because that is where the complications are going to come can do a perfect resection, beautiful dissection, and then at the end have a huge problem that is a leak that does not um, heal. And we need to have plan, plan A, B, C, and D for reconstruction. So it's essential to know for endoscopic endonasal approaches that at the beginning, as you know, you know the CSF leaks occurred in, in a great, percentage of cases when you know the first techniques of endoscopic expanded approaches came up up to 15 percent and sometimes more of CSF leaks but then with Dr. Haddad, Bagaste Goy, Dr. Carrao and et al they they explained and they came up with the vascularized tissue that really was a game changer especially the nasoceptal flap for skull base coverage where now we have very high success rates with over 95% uh, in the arterial cranial base of success as far as no CSF leak post-op. But we have to also know that not everything is the nasoceptal flap. And sometimes we don't need that because it has some nasal morbidity. Uh, and we can many times uh, close the defects, especially in transillar surgery uh, with no, also non-vascularized mucosal grafts. So for the principles for reconstruction, uh, as we understand it in our team, and this is a lot of the work performed also by Dr. Pinheiro, who is my ENT partner, 
um, is we have the main component uh, of the reconstruction, which is either one of these two or in combination. So the non-vascularized, either mucosal graft, fascia lata, fat graft, with or without, depending on the defect and the patient, vascularized flaps. And then we usually add, add to this a cohesive material like fibrin glue or synthetic glue or similar, which is, we don't think is essential, but we use it. And then we usually have the support material and we like to use resorbable packing because it holds a little bit uh, longer. And then sometimes we use CSFD version in the form usually of lumbar drain. Very important to know, not all the defects are the same, same anatomical defects are not or should not be reconstructed the same way depending on the patient's medical conditions. For instance, patients with obstructive sleep apnea who need a CPAP, you know, usually a few days after surgery, we ideally want to wait a couple of weeks. Some patients cannot wait that long, but we need a more robust reconstruction in this case. Patients who are obese or have increased intracranial pressure, especially pseudotumor cerebri, history or off or need for radiotherapy, and especially all those diseases that are going to cause deficits in hearing, healing, like immunosuppression, steroid treatment, diabetes, et cetera. So we have two big uh, you know, groups of flaps, and we are going to talk today a little bit more about the intranasal flaps, as you know very well. Uh, we have the nasoceptal flap, who, which is the main uh, flap that we have, and then other smaller flaps like the middle turbinate flap, lateral wall flap, anteriorly and posteriorly based, and then a long list of possible extranasal flaps, usually when the nasal flap is not available or does not reach the defect. And the, one of them, the main one I would say is the pericranial flap, but there are other different flaps all the way down to the free flaps. So this is our uh, the algorithm that we usually use in skull-based reconstruction. Uh, so when we don't have any CSF leak and we just have exposed dura, we really don't need, theoretically don't need any reconstruction. Sometimes we put a free mucosal graft, especially if we have, for instance, carotid exposed, et cetera. And then we usually add that a dural sealant if we are going to place a free mucosal graft. If we have a low flow CSF leak, depends on the defect size, usually the cutoff is about one centimeter, one centimeter and a half, where we use either an inlay, either a synthetic or a fascia lata graft with a free mucosal graft is usually enough. Uh, for bigger tumors, we uh, prefer usually to use also the nasoceptal flap as well as an inlay dural graft. And then what we call the CSF uh, high flow uh, leak that could be usually a supracellar cistern entrance into the ventricle or a clival defect. So what we have been uh, using um, successfully has been a bottom fascia lateral graft. And I have to give credit to the Jefferson's team for coming up with this uh, great idea. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. It's like two pieces of fascia lata sutured in the middle. One is gonna go inlay and the other one only, but they are together, so they don't move. And then we, in addition to that, we add the nasoceptal flap and then the dural sealant and absorbable packing. For clival defects, we do the same, but a lot of the times we add a fat graft uh, to fill the clival defect uh, in addition to the bottom graft and an nasoceptal flap. In this case, in clival defects, we usually add a lumbar drain for three to five days, but we don't usually or routinely um, add that for the supracellar or like to transtuberculum and transplanum defects. So basically the principles of what we call the Decalogue of Reconstruction, we always perform a preoperative nasal endoscopy is of paramount importance to know uh, to be known by the team if the patient has septal deviation, septal perforations, for instance, or the lesion affects the nasal septum, in which 
case, sometimes the nasoceptal flag cannot be performed. We have to obviously review the imaging, know our anatomy before going in. Always have a plan for reconstruction, same principle as the open approaches with the endoscopic endonasal approaches. We try as much as we can to preserve both middle turbinates and also both pedicles in the case that we don't, if we don't need to sacrifice any of the pedicles for the nasoceptal flap, the SPA and the posterior septal artery, we preserve them because we don't know if in the future, maybe not for that surgery, but maybe this patient has a recurrence and needs another surgery in the future. In that case, we want to have the vascular pedicles available. And also in the transclival approaches, we try to preserve the roof and posterior wall of the nasopharynx as at all possible, avoiding to perform the lateral cuts uh, in the nasopharynx that we usually did in the past for these cases, because that keeps the gravity uh, in your favor. And we have published uh, a couple of uh, technical notes about that. And also, of course, is very important when you are going to place the reconstruction, either an asoceptal flap or any other reconstruction, drill all bony septations. Make sure that there's no space between the reconstruction and the, the area that has to heal to. So that's extremely important. And also remove all the mucosa around the defect and along the course of the flap towards the defect, because if we have mucosa against mucosa, that's not going to heal. If we use, we use multilayer reconstruction with an inlay substitute or a fascia graft, uh, uh, graft uh, we try to avoid in synthetic rigid implants. If we need a rigid implant, we like to perform an osteopericondrial uh, nasal flap. We can get a little bit of the cartilage of the flap with the vascularized flap, and we think that that's, uh, that's more uh, biologically uh, acceptable with less uh, lower risk for infection, in our opinion. And it's very important not to interpose the dural sealant or any other material between the flap and the bone or dural substitute Be because everything, and that also goes for any hematomas, anything that uh, is between the area that we need to reconstruct and the flap that avoids direct contact of the perichondrial and periostal part of the flap is going to, uh, not be really good for uh, reconstruction. It's going to be um, a problem for it. Then we, we really support the reconstruction with absorbable packing when at all possible, because then we don't have to take that part of the packing out. And with that, it can be sometimes adherent to the flap. So if we place at least a layer of absorbable packing, uh, that is, uh, in our experience, has worked really well. And then the last one, but not least important, is that we need to take into account the risk factors and preoperative morbidity uh, to modify their construction options accordingly. As I said, not the same anatomical defect is going to end up with the same reconstruction. So then I, I would like to go through quickly uh, through the most common defects that we encounter in endoscopic expanded skull base. Uh, and the first one uh, is the cellar. And this is, we are going to talk about the defects in midline. Starting with the center of the skull base, this is the cellar region. So as you know, we have the percasmatic sulcus above the cellar region and the tuberculum. This is the planum and the cruciform plate. So these defects uh, in this area above the cella are going to be high flow leaks, uh, including the ventricle, as well as the defects in the posterior fossa or the clival defects. So for cellar defects, our experience is that the free mucosal graft works well for most patients. And then Dr. Pinheiro has developed a, a modification of uh, a nasoceptal flap that is a little bit less morbid because it has less surface. That is the posterior septal flap that really works well for those patients uh, with whom we don't think that the free mucosal graft is going to be appropriate, such as really obese patients, 
patients on CPAP, but uh, who have really not very large uh, defects to raise an asusceptible flap. So we want to decrease the overuse of an asusceptible flap. In our opinion, not all the cellular defects uh, need an asusceptible flap. And we have gone through, uh, you know, have switched to using more and more the free mucosal graft. And the free mucosal graft are non-vascularized tissue, but still heal very well because it's part of the mucosa. So we usually raise them from the floor of the nose. And because this mucosa is, is quite thick, the mucosa of the middle turbinate is not as thick uh, here and as, as well as the mucosa of the inferior turbinate, but the floor is really a nice mucosa. We, so we take part of the inferior aspect of the, um, the inferior meatus mucosa, and then we go towards the septum and you can even take a little bit of the septal mucosa. And this is the way that uh, the, the muc free mucosal graft is raised. And this is after uh, reconstructing the defect and you can see uh, the healing after a month and three months. Uh, that's for a pituitary surgery. So our series of uh, 245 patients, this is uh, along with Dr. Tyler Kenning and Dr. Pinheiro. So early on, uh, we use more nasoceptal flaps with an 11% harvesting rate for only uh, transcellular approaches we are talking about with a 7.4% CFCF leak rate, but then we switched to the free mucosal graft with an inlay dural graft and free mucosal graft and dural sealant with no nasoceptive flap with a 0% uh, harvesting rate and the postoperative CSF leak was 0.4%. And these we published in a couple of papers uh, with increasing number of papers for uh, patients for cellular defects. So our reconstruction is an inlay dural graft and then an only free mucosal graft for every patient, except the patients who may need CPAP early on, et cetera, and have a high flow leak. And we've seen that the free mucosal graft really after a resection, we can see in three months, 12 months and 24 months really you know, uh, enhances after a while. So it kind of incorporates into uh, the mucosa of the nose very nicely. So this is the, as you know, the most, uh, you know, the, the flap that really has changed the endoscopic endonasal approaches that the, is the classic nasoceptal flap. It has the area, this is the posterior septal artery with the area of the pedicle. The area in which we are going to adapt we are going to use to adapt the flap to where we want it to go. And this is the reconstructive surface, really the perichondrial, periosteal uh, part of it. That is in the most anterior part is the one that we're going to use to uh, place against the defect, in this case, uh, tuberculum planum defect. So this is uh, a classical uh, video of uh, our team performing, this is Dr. Pinheiro, performing a, a nasoceptal flap, posterior incision, then going towards the anterior incision. Uh, so this is the anterior part of the nose. We really need to maximize the flap. So this is the superior incision at the level of the axilla of the middle turbinate. Then we turn up to preserve the olfactory mucosa and this is going to the anterior aspect of the nose. And then once we join the superior and inferior incisions, and this is something that also the neurosurgeons should be uh, able to perform. Uh, and this is carefully uh, dissecting the flap uh, with subperichondrial, subperiosal dissection. This is something that uh, we need to be very careful in this area with any tears or any holes in the nasoceptal flap. And then once we, we go past this area, the nasoceptal flap really dissects nicely posteriorly, and we can use uh, small nas in nasal uh, scissors to really um, finish up any cuts that the bobby didn't, uh, may not have finished. 
And then we have a very nicely preserved uh, nasoceptal flap for reconstruction that we can place in the nasopharynx on the maxillary sinus. So this is the anatomical view of this. And then there's a variation uh, that uh, we developed recently, that is the posterior uh, septum uh, flap. And this is the, a small version of the nasal septal flap in which we only use the posterior aspect of the septum and the floor of the nasal cavity. And this is less morbid because it forms, does, does, this does not form as much crusting as the standard nasal septal flap. And it's good for some uh, higher flow uh, standard cellular defects. I wouldn't use it for a transplanum transtuberculum approach, but uh, we have seen in, in, with endosian in green that it really enhances. So it's a truly vascularized flap. And this is how it looks like uh, one must post operative. If we go to the supracellular defects, we have, uh, first, uh, we are going to talk about the expanded approaches, especially the olfactory groove, in which case we usually perform an inlay uh, graft uh, that can be fascia lata or collagen graft, and then an isoceptal flap. And we're going to talk a little bit about the extension, possible extension of the pedicle uh, to increase the length of the nasoceptal flap. And then also we're going to talk a little bit about the tuberculin and planum approaches in which we use the Jefferson's graft, the bottom graft of fascia lata and the nasoceptal flap. So this is the area that we're going to talk about, the tuberculum, the planum, and the olfactory groove. So this is olfactory groove meningioma. And here we perform a very limited resection of the ethmoid, just the superior ethmoidal resection in which we are going to end up with a defect this large. And this is an, a short video of the approach in which we, we still preserve the, the middle turbinates in, uh, bilaterally in this approach because we don't really need to take them out. We, we still can uh, nicely have access to, uh, to the tumor. And you can see this is, is the olfactory uh, fossa, and then we have the, uh, the cusa or the sonopet to remove the tumor. And at the end, that's what we, we have. We have a very large area that we really need to have a plan to reconstruct. So in this case, we placed an inlay collagen graft, and this is the nasoceptal flap. And you can see that the nasoceptal flap really reaches just enough for this uh, for this defect, because if we enlarge this craniotomy a little bit more, then the nasoceptal flap is not going to reach. So this is the postoperative result. And this is how we placed the, the nasoceptal flap in this case. But then we, used, we looked at it in the lab and we saw that the nasoceptal flap really just reaches up to the posterior uh, just inferior to the posterior table of the frontal sinus. If you have defects such as this, the nasoceptal flap, the classical nasoceptal flap does not reach. So the idea was to really see if we could go to the pterygopalatin fossa and dissect the, uh, the internal maxillary artery to see if we could reach, have the flap reach uh, anteriorly. And the problem with this can be the, the venous uh, drainage, but we've seen in the lab that really the perivenous drainage of the, and of the posterior septal artery, the spinopalatine artery, goes really around the artery. So it does not become an issue as we have experienced. So if we dissect and extend the, the dissection to the internal maxillary artery and mobilize it, we have up to three centimeters of additional reach in which we can uh, really extend the length of the nasal septal flap down to the almost the whole posterior table of the frontal sinus. So this is our uh, paper extrapolating the limits of the nasoceptal flap. And this is another uh, study in which we saw that the standard flap had this dimension as far as uh, reach um, in relationship to the nostril. And then we got about three additional centimeters of reach with the flap. And this is a case in which we use that reconstruction 
is, is a moderate vehicle accident, a patient with an anterior cranial base uh, fracture, really high in the posterior table in which uh, patient was leaking. So this is a dissection uh, of the pedicle of the uh, pterygopalatine fossa. To, so this is the SPA foramen. So then what we want to do is to really go to the pterygopalatine fossa. And this is, uh, is not an easy technique to perform, but once we have uh, really all our, um, you know, the anatomy, we know the anatomy of this area, uh, it becomes a lot uh, easier. We use micro dopplers to localize the anterior, the, the IMAX and the SPA. So you can see that we have uh, performed an incision, and this is Dr. Pinheiro finishing up the dissection. This is the uh, sphenopalatine artery, and this is uh, dissecting the periosteum. And you can see nicely the artery, and these are little uh, veins that we, we have studied in the lab as well that are around it. So you basically open the periosteum here, release uh, the artery, and this is a post-operative MRI, a post-operative day one, in which we are able to see that the nasoceptal flap, flap really enhances. This is pre and post contrast. So really, and the patient had an uneventful recovery as far as the CSF week. So just to talk a little bit about uh, the uh, bottom graft of fascia lata that uh, the Jefferson group uh, first described and we, we use regularly for tuberculum and plenum defects is an inlay and an onlay, and we place a suture in the middle, in which case you can really place the parts of the inlay graft and the onlay, and they really don't move and stay in place. We have had good success with that, and then we place the nasoceptal flap, and you can place it in two ways, either opposed uh, with the uh, pedicle, and the, uh, this green area opposed to the clivus, uh, or you can place the nasoceptal flap laterally and then uh, you know, uh, cover the defect. So two different ways of uh, placing the nasoceptal flap, both of them uh, acceptable. And this is one of the defects that you can have in which you have the preasmatic sulcus, access to the supracellar system, so a, a high, um, Low CSF leak. So this is a growing uh, meningioma in which we can see uh, the anatomical landmarks really nicely. And then I'm gonna, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna go towards the defect. So this is, uh, we can see uh, the CSF from the supracellar cisterns, the optic nerve, and this is the defect that we're gonna have uh, to reconstruct. In this case, a small size defect, but uh, high flow CSF leak. These are the chiasmatic branches. So we're gonna see how we perform, how we place the bottom graft. So this is the bottom graft being placed. So the two layers of, uh, of fascia lata, one is carefully placed in lay. You want it not to be very bulky uh, in size, so not to compress any of the delicate structures. So we usually uh, prefer to put the inlay uh, graft a little smaller than the onlay, and then it really nicely opposes it. And it's really well placed when you don't see any CSF. Just with that, you don't see any CSF leaking around that. But of course, you need to place the nasoceptal flap, and this is really take your time placing the nasoceptal flap and then we put the fibrin glue and, um, and the resorbable packing. This is another case in which you have a greater defect in the dura. This is another uh, many, a growing meningioma with a, in a conchal uh, type of, uh, or a prisilar type of sinus. And at the end of the reconstruction, we're gonna have a really, uh, quite large defect with a uh, high flow CSF leak. And you can see when we start dissecting, we start opening uh, the cisterns, we can see really high flow uh, CSF leak around. Uh, at the end of the operation, because the cisterns have been emptied, 
there could be a false sensation that there's not really a high flow CSF leak, but anatomically is always a high flow CSF leak. So by gentle traction and um, careful um, debulking of the tumor, coagulation of the uh, uh, branches that are going to the tumor, we can we really uh, remove this uh, this tumor entirely. And you can see like a, a very sizable defect now that uh, we, re we are going to reconstruct the same way. I think it's important to have the, a systematic that works for your team of reconstruction. And although it's the last part of the operation, it's a key part of the operation. So we need to pay as much attention to the reconstruction as we pay to the resection. And that's why there's is really uh, important to have a good team that, uh, you know, that works in both phases, uh, neurosurgeon and ENT really working together. Uh, so the pattern graft again with the nasoceptor flap and the fibrin glue, and this is the postoperative result. For uh, spontaneous CSF leak or post-traumatic CSF leak, we can a lot of the times use uh, free mucosal graft, like in this case, that was a very small defect. Uh, and then a couple of minutes about the Clival defects. I think they are very challenging to reconstruct. They're uh, the only, about the only cases uh, usually where we place the lumbar drain for reconstruction. And in our series we have uh, for supracellar, tuberculum cellar, uh, and plenum, et cetera, defects less than 1% CSF leak rate. Uh, the Clival defects are very uh, difficult to reconstruct. We try to, um, preserve as much as we can of the nasopharynx, um, depending on the defect. But a lot of the times we use an extended nasoceptal flap depending on the defect. And what that is, is that we add to the standard flap, the floor and the inferior meatus mucosa. And this is the reconstruction that we placed an inlay graft that we sometimes place button or not, use of this fascia lata, and then some fat to, to uh, level the clival re uh, recess that has been removed. And then the nasoceptor flap is placed along with a lumbar drain. This is another use of the extended flap where you use the inferior uh, meatus mucosa on the floor of the nose. Uh, mucosa right there. If the defect is really large in the olfactory group, plenum, tuberculum, and cella. And this is how it looks like in a, in a real case. This is the standard anasoceptal flap. So this is the, this is the standard flap and the addition of the extended. So the extended part of the flap really uh, goes towards the inferior clivus and uh, Cranial cervical junction. So this is all I ha had today. Uh, I will be happy to take any questions. And I just want to finalize uh, talking to you about the case that we have in Rochester. I invite you to the skull base course. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor Silda, for, for this excellent presentation. Uh, there is uh, one question in chat box. Could you please uh, answer it? So about the uh, olfactory preservation, so the in the transtuberculum times planum approaches, uh, we do olfactory preservation because anatomically you don't need to remove the olfactory mucosa. In the case of olfactory group meningiomas, in the, if the patients have olfactory function preserved before surgery, we do a transcranial approach. I have a question, Thank you. if you don't mind. Okay, okay thanks. Uh, Professor Selda, that was a beautiful talk. Um, really explained the ways to repair the skull-based defect. And uh, you're really pushing the boundaries and a and lot of innovative ideas here, which I'm sure will become very popular uh, in course of time. One, I just would like to, to get your view on using some bony buttress or, or, or some rigid fix, rigid um, replacement 
Uh, I, I know that you mentioned it in your talk that you don't use any artificial substance. What about methyl cartilage or something else, especially when you have um, patients with, uh, for example, high pressure or, um, or uh, there is a higher risk of uh, leak, in including patients who, who, who's got uh, sleep apnea and you may want to restart them on the CPAPs fairly soon after. What's your view on it? Thank you. That's an excellent question. And so for we use sometimes a semi-rigid reconstruction, but we uh, add to the nasoceptal flap part of the septum, part of the cartilage, but we don't detach it. So oh. we use what we call the osteo uh, nasoceptal flap that has a little bit of the septum attached to the nasoceptal flap. And then we oppose that part, little part of the septum towards the defect with the nasoceptal flap. That's what we uh, do sometimes in very selective cases. Sure. Thanks very much. Sure. Thank you, uh, Professor Silda, uh, for the excellent presentation.